Hey everybody, this is Jeffrey Powers uh, with Geekazine, and you are here on another HP TechCast. Today we're going to be talking about tape storage and how it's not dead just yet. We're going to talk about it more. First of all, I've got my panel here, and uh, to, my, to, my, uh, to my right, your left, is Mr. Calvin Zito, HP Storage Guy. How are you doing, Calvin? Yo, hey, Jeffrey. Hey, it's good to be back doing this again, and uh, this is third time's a charm, right? <laughs> we had some technical difficulties on the first try, try and the second try. There were cameras wouldn't work, and now everybody's camera's working, so we're, we're going to give this uh, another spin and see what happens. So we've got two great guests above, well, they're above me. Um, first of all, we'll start to my right above, uh, Mr. Bob Conway. How you doing, Bob? I'm fine. Uh, pleased to meet everyone. I'm glad everything seems to be working. Uh, I am the lead uh, person for product management in the HP Tape organization, uh, HP Store Ever is our brand, our sub-brand, and uh, it's really good to talk to everyone today. Hey, Bob, you've got a lot of books in your library there. Wow, you must, you must read a lot. You look like you read a lot. I've got a few books, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> just one of those things, you know. I have a lot of books I don't read, though. Anyway, uh, to to my to the to the they're upper all, area, upper square uh, is Mr. Jason Buffington. How are you doing, Jason? Uh, good morning. I'm doing great, thanks. And by the way, I have a lot of books on an e-reader, but the e-reader doesn't look nearly as impressive when you put it behind your head. That's true. <laughs> I just I, I yeah I I have one of those e-readers too, and I just bought one of the uh, popular books and. I've got that on my shelf, and 50 I still have. Fifty Shades of Grey. You're not reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Please no, tell I'm, me you're not. Actually, actually, it was Beautiful Creatures that we just downloaded onto the onto the uh, e-reader. Good for you. So, and I'm not going to read that. So, anyway, <laughs> today we're talking about storage, and of course, a couple weeks ago, a uh, major announcement came out that, uh, and and everybody knew about it. It was it was it was forthcoming, and finally uh, came out. LTO six is out there. And so we thought we'd get this uh, group together and talk a little bit about uh, about where tape is, where it's going, what it's doing, and and how it's working, and how important is it in today's storage systems, especially when we've got uh, we've got hard drives and SSDs and and other types of uh, of systems that can make things a little bit cheaper and make things a little bit faster. So. Um, now we're going to start with uh, Jason. You've got a you've got a really nice PowerPoint presentation we're going to go through, and you guys over at ESG um, have actually put together a full survey on this uh, on the current state of LTO. Um, what have what have you guys found so far? Fair enough. So if you want to go ahead and bring up the slides, uh, let me just kind of set some context really quick. Um, yeah, so, so my, my particular space, so, uh, so I'm the senior analyst at the Enterprise Strategy Group that covers data protection. Um, I've been in data protection for about 22 years or so, and, uh, and uh, for those that are uh, watching from home, uh, I encourage you to check out my blog, technicaloptimist.com, um, or follow me on Twitter as jbuff. Um, if you go to the next slide, just as an introduction to who ESG is, um, the Enterprise Strategy Group, we are an analyst firm. Um, so we do IT research, analysts, and strategy. So basically, we look at what are people doing, what do the people think they think they're going to be doing, um, why do people think they're doing what they're going to be doing, and then we kind of put it all together with practitioners like myself and try to uh, uh, coach not only uh, the vendors on what to make and how to go to market, but also the channel and IT pros on what you should be looking for and expecting from the technology community. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what ESG is. And, uh, and what I wanted to share to kind of set some context for our conversation today is, is uh, two different pieces of research. Um, one of them ESG does every year is called the IT Spending Intentions Report. If you'll go to slide three for me, Jeffrey. Um, you know, my, uh, my, my pastor used to say, if you really want to know what somebody's priorities are, look in their checkbook. And, uh, and if you look at uh, um, what, the, what uh, folks said they were planning on making investments in in 2013, this is the, uh, this is the top 10 list um, for 2013. And you'll notice, by the way, number two, improved data backup and recovery. And then down on the bottom, it was actually a five-way tie for ninth place. Um, but that, but uh, two of the five included regulatory compliance initiatives as well as business continuity disaster 
disaster recovery programs. So you can see that uh, that uh, backup is a is a very well funded, highly prioritized part of most IT uh, initiatives this year. I will also point out um, that uh, improved backup recovery is number two this year. It was actually number one last year, um, and then uh, business continuity I think came in at number six. So uh, so folks are are starting to move down that path uh, um, uh, from 2012 now in 2013. Um, three of the top ten still arguably are backup and recovery centric. So people are planning on investing in it. They know it's not right yet. Um, and they're looking for new technologies or new approaches to solve um, what many of us think of as age old problems. Um, now, if you took a double click into what do they really mean by how they're going to be investing in data protection, if you'll click to slide four for me, you'll see the top two initiatives um, for 2012 actually were improving disaster recovery and meeting compliance requirements. So again, big shifts around the strategic side of backup recovery, not just the tactical. Let's go ahead one more slide, and now we're going to break down a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Boy Scouts, and one of the things we tell Scouts, especially when we're out on a trail, is you can't tell where you're going unless you know where you are. And so this uh, uh, rather busy-looking pie chart is, is meant to help us figure out where are we. Um, and, uh, and so what I'd like to do, let's see, um, this is kind of busy as this. So we're going to highlight a few boxes for you. Click another box for me. Go to slide six. All right. So on slide six, what you're really looking at here is we're looking at the different ways that people are using tape. And I think some of my boxes might have disappeared. So what I'm going to kind of walk you through is over on that left-hand side, that, uh, that teal wedge uh, says about 10% of folks are still going straight to tape, D to T. So from production disk directly to tape as their primary, in this case, exclusive means of recovery. Awesome. The, the boxes are going to show up. Now, if uh, um, that next pink box that shows up and uh, right around the uh, 7 o'clock time frame, that green box says another 15% are going disk to tape to tape, meaning first they're going to have a tape which is on premise, and then they're going to have another tape, or, another, or at least a copy of that, that vaults off site. Now, what I want to point out here is that means that, um, you know, I, uh, I think, Jeffrey, you were the one who said uh, we're not, uh, tape is not dead yet. The only time I ever use the phrase tape is dead is if I want to start a bar fight at a trade show, because um, that's a really good way to get a lot of people really excited. Because uh, the reality is if you look at these two pink boxes for 25 percent, 10 plus 15, that, that's my right math, right Calvin? So 25 percent of folks, um, uh, tape is the only means of recovery they have. Um, so that's a, one out of four. That's a far cry from you know uh, uh, dead and buried. Um, now, as much as, as that's interesting, though, I think the, the better way to use tape for most folks is let's click one more box over, and you'll see that um, Dist to dist, it's oh, uh, went a little fast. Um, oh well. Um, the uh, in that upper right hand corner, that really obnoxious dark blue wedge, um, that is disk to disk to tape. And what that means is, is first going to disk for um, for whether it's deduplication, optimization, compression, um, all, all those good things that disk based backup is good for, and then goes to tape. And that's another thirty one percent of folks. So roughly a third of the folks are saying first we're going to go. Thank you very much. Um, first to disk. And then we're going to go off to tape for our long-term retention model. And to me, that makes the most sense. And, uh, and since, uh, since Mr. HP Storage Guy is on the line, um, you know, the, the right scenario, this, um, or the model that we might look at for this would be, say, going to a store once appliance for dedupe and then going off to, uh, to store all for tape. Um, as a, as a long-term retention model. So um, if you add that up, so 25% are going straight to tape. It's the only means of recovery they've got. Another 31% are using tape as a tertiary tier after disk is their, as their primary recovery medium. 56%, um, over half of all environments that we surveyed in this last study actually are still using tape as part of their overall data protection strategy. Now, as much as that's interesting, take a look at the other side. If everyone says tape is old, let's look at what's new. So if you'll go to the next slide, which should be, I think, slide seven, the one with the light blue boxes. Thank you very much. Um, you know, you can't have a conversation in IT today without talking about cloud. And, um, and as far as disk to cloud, so straight to cloud as a backup as a service scenario, 2%. Um, two percent of folks are going um, to cloud as opposed to 25% are using tape. So I think there's some interesting numbers there. But 
a lot of folks are understanding that as much as they'd like to use the economics of cloud, um, it's actually pretty easy to back stuff up to an internet-based provider. It's not always as easy to recover, especially bulk uh, recoveries back down again. So what we're seeing is, is, is a larger interest in disk to disk to cloud. So first it is for fast recovery and then um, off to cloud for that, for that um, uh, long distance storage, which is what you'd see in the uh, upper left-hand corner around 11 o'clock, that pink wedge. So about 5% of folks just to just to cloud, 2% straight to cloud. So cloud is only shows up in around 7% of data protection strategy as opposed to tape at 56. Um, next slide, slide 8. So if those are the extremes, um, we got disk on one side, obviously uh, tape on one side and cloud on the other. Let's look at disk as a, as a pure solution. 15% of folks, that yellow wedge in the lower right-hand corner, um, say they're going disk to disk. So they have a secondary copy, it's on additional disk, um, and that's what they got. Um, and if the other green boxes will comply with us, you'll see that, let's try another green box and see if it shows up. Sorry about the builds, guys. If it doesn't work, we'll just keep talking. And we're going to keep talking. All right. So, um, so 15% are disk to disk in the lower right hand corner. If you looked at um, the orange wedge right around 8 o'clock, um, you'd see disk to disk to WAN. So, first, there is an on prem disk. Like a, this is like a, um, a large regional office. So, first, it goes to um, disk which is on prem. That gives that regional office a fast recovery capability. And then it goes to a WAN. So, um, someplace, uh, say the corporate headquarters or um, some other um, um, appreciable IT facility um, is another 15%. And then if you look in the purple wedge right around 10 o'clock, you get disk to WAN. So that's more of a branch office scenario where they don't have a local recovery capability, but they are backing up all that branch office or remote office data um, back to corporate headquarters. So I guess here, here's, the, here's the rest of the math. So disk as, an, as the only means of recovery, 15 plus 15 plus 7, so 37% disk is the only means of recovery they have. And then if you also add another 31% for D to D to T, another 5% for D to D to C, you get around 73% of folks are using DISC as their primary tier of recovery before they then either go to a um, tape for long-term retention, cloud for long distance, um, HQ across the WAN for um, uh, uh, protection of remote office data. So that kind of gives you a context. So about 73% of folks, so about three out of four, are use DISC as their primary means of, of uh, first tier re uh, recovery. However, 56% uh, uh, of folks are using tape as, as their long-term media um, uh, uh, of choice, and oh, by the way, tape is in use for 25% overall. So, um, uh, uh, Jeffrey, to answer your question earlier, tape is far from dead. Um, so, uh, but that's not to say, for example, that um, that people aren't reevaluating how they're doing things. And I think there, there's a lot of reasons why. Certainly, economics plays a big part of it. Um, just trying to figure out how can I do things cheaper, um, particularly at scale. Um, everybody's data is growing at, um, at at high percentage rates. Um, so you know, how do we do at scale um, and, uh, and and economically? The other thing, though, they have to look at, though, is um, wh how is how is the status quo meeting their current data protection strategies? So if you'll go to the next slide for me, it should have uh, four uh, uh, four line bars on it. Let's see. I'm thinking that's going to be slide ten. Very good. All right. So when you look at slide 10, so we actually, um, in, uh, in a piece of research last year called the Data Protection Modernization Trends, basically saying what kind of data are you doing in your environment? What kind of changes are you making? Um, if you're looking on slide 10 and somehow the slide has gone backwards again, which is kind of funky, um, there you go. Um, stay on that one. No one touch your mouse. Um, okay. So we asked two groups of folks. We said, how are you, um, uh, how are backups going for you? How are recoveries going for you? We asked uh, the uh, yellow group are the IT people responsible for data protection. The blue group, by the way, are the application owners, the guys whose stuff is getting backed up. And, uh, and just to kind of get a feel for them. So if you look at the bars on the left, the numbers are pretty similar. So, um, so I'm going to use the, um, the, the blue numbers because they're our customer, right? So 85% um, said that the backups were successfully completing within their backup window. Um, so if you think about that, okay, so 85%, so basically one out of seven-ish. Um, 
um, are failing. One out of seven is kind of a funky number because what that basically means is that for every seven days worth of jobs, so maybe it's a full and then six incrementals or whatever you're doing, but but uh, but one out of seven jobs um, is at some point is either not completing within the window or it's just not completing at all. Um, and, and that's a little bit risky, but as long as you've got decent retry logic and your, and your RPOs are negotiated correctly, I think you're okay with that. It's not great, but it's, um, it could be better. The one I think that's more troubling, though, is the numbers on the right. Um, if you look on that blue bar again, just because the math is easier, 80% of the recoveries are successfully completing within the prescribed RPO, RTO, SLA. So let me unpack that for you. It doesn't mean 80% of recoveries are completing, period. That would be even worse of a problem. But what this says is, once the IT guys have gone to the database owners, the virtualization owners, the workload folks, and said, okay, this is what we're using for data backup recovery. This is how fast it works. This is what my staffing requirements are. This is the help desk process to um, submit a restore request, blah, 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 blah. Okay, after you've done all that and the IT department and the um, application owners have said, okay, we agree, this is going to be our service level agreement, this is our SLA for how fast and how, and how much data we're going to get back, they're only meeting that negotiated number four out of five times. Um, and I think that's a real problem. Um, after you did your negotiations, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those things, you, you know, you, uh, you under-promise and over-deliver. Well, in this case, this is something where after they made their promise, whatever that was, they're all hitting that four out of five times. And I think those types of statistics are why we're seeing such a shift for folks are trying to re-examine what they're doing. Um, they're trying to re-examine are there better technologies out there to use, and they're trying to re-examine is there better software out there to use. Um, and by the way, um, our data keeps growing, and we're outgrowing the backup solution we bought not that many years ago. So is there a less, uh, uh, there's less, or a less costly way um, to get done what we want to get done? So those are the primary driving factors. And in fact, when you put it all together, this is a completely subjective number. But if you'll go to slide 11, the one with the pie chart, um, this is kind of that last piece of data that um, I will uh, share with you. Um, you know, I, I've been in backup recovery now for about 22 years. Um, you know, I, I, I pretend to be a storage guy on TV, and occasionally I'll, I'll do some virtualization or systems administration, but I'm really a backup guy. And, you know, for as long as I've been in backup, backup was kind of a religion, you know, you is or, or a political party. I mean, once you signed up for it, you were just kind of in for life. Um, and, and backup today is just not as sticky as it used to be. I have another piece of data which is not in today's charts that actually talks about um, uh, uh, the average uh, owner of backup has had their current solution for less than three years. But if you look at it from a little bit broader picture, if you, if you ask somebody, hey, if you had the chance to start from scratch on your backup solution, what would you do? Um, and that yellow wedge in the lower left-hand corner, only 32%. Um, so basically a third of, of the IT pros out there said um, we would use the same solution we've got today. Um, the other two-thirds of folks are looking for something different. 16% um, uh, in the upper left-hand corner said they'd go to the cloud. Um, and then 44% said they would use a new architecture, a new solution. Uh, uh, they're looking for something different than what they've got, and they're reassessing some of the old arguments that they've had in the past. They're reassessing things like it's not snapshots versus backups, it's snapshots plus backups. And it's not just disk-based backup, it's disk plus tape plus cloud. Um, uh, all of the old preconceptions are going out the window because the, the types of data and the workloads and the scale plus costs are forcing people to reevaluate all the presumptions they've had in the past. And I think that's probably a pretty good setup for, um, uh, for what we're going to talk about today as far as uh, this is not your granddaddy's tape. So if you want to uh, uh, drop that last slide again, um, uh, you're going to see a lot from, uh, from me in 2013 on, uh, on a series I'm calling Tape in a Cloudy World um, and talking about uh, um, the, the role of each of the three kinds of media as it relates to an overall data protection strategy. Um, so check that out on technicaloptimist.com uh, or uh, uh, Twitter jbuff. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of missing you guys for a bit. So if you want to bring some faces back up, uh, let's, let's not make this all about me talking to a screen. Well, it's great, great context setting for what we want to talk about. Uh, so that's great, Jason. Thanks for that. Um, hey, Bob. So you know, we talked about the challenges users have with backup, and we've kind of mentioned that there's this new LTO six thing, uh, our store over LTO six. From what you've seen from customers, the challenges that they faced in the past, what kinds of things are new with LTO six that will help them? kind of address some of these challenges with uh, with backup and recovery that we've seen here. 
So I think it's important to emphasize that the the mode of uh, operation that we would recommend as Hewlett Packard would be that sort of disk to tape, sorry, disk to disk to tape methodology that Jason talked about, where uh, you would use a first line disk backup uh, from well, something like our store one range of products to do deduplication and, and get those faster restores off the system. But then where LTO technology and LTO6 in particular comes into its own is longer term, very low cost storage tiers. Um, if you look at the cost of ownership, um, LTO6 is typically offering something in the region of 2.5 cents per gigabyte uh, for massive amounts of data. So LTO6 itself, it, it follows the roadmap quite closely for LTO sixth generation. We've gone to 6.25 terabytes on a single tape, uh, and that will give you uh, 1.44 terabytes per hour. So really good transfer rates, really high capacities. And we then put that into a complete range of uh, drives and automation units uh, basically physical tape libraries, which will take us from 6.25 terabytes all the way up to 44 petabytes in one of our ESL G3 uh, libraries with about 7,000 7, cartridges. So you get that massive scale. Library. Yeah, 7,000 cartridges in an ESL G3. So it's offering massive scale. Yeah. Now, Calvin, why are you surprised by that? I mean, don't you have um, uh, an ESL behind that curtain behind you? I mean, just count them. It's 7,000. Come on. You know, I'm going to try and talk to Bob about just getting a, an LTO because, I, you know, I do a lot of work with, uh, with, uh, with video, and I'm starting to run out of disk space, and it's just, you know, it's just old video that's taken up space on a disk drive that, uh, you know, Bob, the thing we haven't really talked about yet focused on yeah, backup just... here is the fact that LTO is a great option for long-term archiving outside of a backup process using things like LTFS. So um, I'm looking for you to use your massive amount of influence to get me an LTO drive so I can hook it up to my works workstation and get some LTFS going here. No problem. Well, so By the way, I, I have an LTO drive at my office. Just telling you. Just I point that out. Ha. That was and Bob. And I'm doing no, my best, was... but um, demand's high. Demand's good, so uh, which is not a bad thing. Um, the, the important thing for your application, Calvin, is uh, the implementation of LTFS, Linear Tape File System, which will allow you to use a, a drag and drop functionality to take your video clips off your hard disk and onto your tape drive in a way that's never been possible, certainly before LTO5. So LTFS is supported on our LTO5 and our new LTO6 drives, and that will offer massive amounts of functionality, uh, particular for people in the media and entertainment business, where the ability to just move large files around uh, is really important. How that works is we, we use a tape with two partitions, and we keep the metadata of the file on the tape, as well as the data on the tape. So wherever that tape is transported around the world, the guys who receive it will be able to look at the metadata and take the file off, and it's application independent, which is another very important factor within that. So let me, let me pile on to this, because I think this is really interesting. You know, when we think about, say, 20 plus years ago, and people, um, you know, when we're thinking about our, you know, granddaddy's tape, and, and everyone said, oh, you know, the media may not be as reliable, and, and the transfer rate's too slow, so we have to do something different. And, that, and so two decades ago, what we said was, hey, let's use this disk thing and random access and all the things that sounded like the right kind of behaviors for backup. And, and, but the problem was is that backup software didn't know what to do with 
with a disk drive. So what they did was they they used uh, virtual tape libraries, VTL. So they made disk look like tape so the backup software could know what to do with it, right? And then over the last 15 years or so, we figured out that actually treating disk like tape um, uh, doesn't really take the full advantage of disk-based backups. You can't do as well for dedupe. You can't do granular stores as well. So, so there's some reasons why that wasn't the ideal form to go for. Um, what we're looking at here is kind of that pendulum completely reversing around. With LTFS, you now have a tape drive that looks like a disk. And and the same way that, you know, 20 years ago, backup software didn't know what to do with a, with a disk drive. Now, a lot of folks have forgotten how flexible tape can be. And now what we're really seeing is, um, you know, and Calvin, to rub this in, I really do have an LTO5 drive that's connected to one of my servers in my home office. And the way that I access it is my T drive. Um, it is a mountable file system. It looks like every other drive letter that's in my uh, on my server, and I just drag and drop files across, and then I hear the little head start whirring as as it uh, as it lays that data down. But basically, instead of a virtual tape library making um, disk look like tape, I really have a virtual disk device. Um, in my LTO5 cartridge. So really the, the whole world has kind of come full circle on that. Um, and then, by the way, um, I just pop my cartridges out of my drive, Calvin, and then I can take them to a third-party location, which is safe and secure, because that's the benefit of having um, uh, that tape media format um, without having to replicate uh, across sites. That does Bob, bring I'd be up happy even with an LTO5, Bob. Just, just saying. <laughs> that does bring up a very interesting question, um, and that is... Uh, uh, Sound and uh, sound and heat dispersion of an LTO system. Are are we talking something that's going to be little? Well, it's going to be louder than a disk drive. Um, is is it going to? Uh, do they need to have you know, special cooling or anything like that for 44.4 petabytes worth of uh, worth of data in an LTO uh, ES, ESL G3 tape system? Um, you, you'd just use normal data center cooling. Um, you'd probably need less in actual fact because of the 7,000 tapes in a 44 petabyte system, very few of them are actually moving at any one time. So most of the tapes are sitting in slots, not powered up, not, not creating or using any power, um, not using, creating any heat. Uh, you don't have to power it up, you don't have to cool it, therefore. So overall, that data is going to be much, much cheaper to keep on near line uh, rather than online the, than keeping it on spinning disks all of the time. And that's an, another great advantage. Um, the, the main uh, area where these things are going to be very useful in the, fr in the future will be in large archives where you're, you're not moving much data in or out of a library. You're keeping it on the system and near line so that um, the access time may be uh, minutes rather than seconds on a disk drive. But depending on, on how your hierarchical storage management works, you'll be going back to data that uh, hasn't been accessed for some time. And most users in their this um, their SLAs will be happy to wait a few minutes, you know, even half an hour, rather than have to uh, pay the cost of keeping things on spinning disk. So there's, we have to keep in mind that every time that it's a balance. It's you know, it's it's not disk or tape. It's disk and tape. You know, and these functions for too long. I think people have been trying to take stances that have been, uh, I suppose, verging on the adversarial about whether you should use tape or you should use disk. And, and we would maintain you use them both because they both have their benefits in the right place. So I would, uh, Verging you, on the adversarial. You would, and cooling is one yeah, of you'd, you'd, you'd kind of uh, classify, let's say, disk as a short-term memory type situation and tape being the long-term memory um, in, in the retention. I, I would say so. Uh, I am obviously biased, uh, being uh, store ever <laughs> orientated, but I do believe it gives the best value for customers when they come in to look after this their data. Um, again, you know, the, people forget that disasters do happen, and off-site storage of 
backups of data, even backups of archives will be important. So the, the ability to have a large archive on a tape library, but also take copies of those tapes miles away or continents away could be very vital for people to maintain their business continuity. You know, if you think of the havoc that was wrecked in that terrible tsunami a, a year or two ago, uh, no one ever envisaged that sort of disaster. Mm -hmm. um, having off-site storage in those sort of circumstances you know, no matter how it's done, whether it's done by replication over wires uh, or not, it's just essential to have that disaster recovery. And with bandwidth limitations and costs, we would still see an advantage for tape uh, and off-site storage of tape. Well, Bob, I think it was a pretty public failure um, about a year ago, but when Gmail lost uh, thousands and thousands of mailboxes, uh, my understanding is, is that they used LTO to recover that, right? They, they, didn't, they didn't use disk-based backup to recover mailboxes. And that was an economics deal, right? Well, that's, that's correct, yeah. It'd be economics, you know, uh, storing all of that data that, you know, if you look at your own email account and look at some of the, the email that you've got in your folders and how long is it, um, it's just as well it's in an electronic folder because you'd be for dusting forever to get all those files cleaned up. So, so uh, I think it's an important factor yeah. that we need to have uh, this storage. Let, let's uh, let, let's Sorry. talk about let's talk about Gmail and those kinds of scenarios. And 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 as I mentioned, you'll see a series from ESG later this year called Tape in a Cloudy World, um, because when you think about some of the dynamics that kind of forced the initial shift away from your granddaddy's tape from a long time ago, a lot of that had to do with things like what the what the presumed speed uh, transfer rate was of of tape. And certainly, when you're looking at something new like the transfer rates of LTO six, I mean that is that that does head and shoulders above where we were many years ago. But when you think about where does tape fit in a world where so much of us are just going to uh, uh, capacity-based pricing and cloud-based storage? Um, I some of those some of those presumptions don't hold anymore. So, for example, if I want to be able to store data um, at scale and I want to be able to do it um, as cheaply as possible, um, I think Bob would agree that easily the, the 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 least expensive way to store large amounts of data is probably tape, right? Um, and remember that for most cloud solutions that are out there, the whole idea of a cloud provider, remember, it's just a deployment model more than anything else in a different way of economics. The whole idea of cloud is saying, look, I can do it at larger scale and cheaper than what you can do it yourself even after I make a profit. I mean, that's the whole business model of cloud. And so I think what you're going to see is, is that as the capabilities come out, um, cloud providers will be able to say, look, um, uh, I don't care as much about transfer speed because, frankly, the, the bottleneck is the pipe between my subscriber and the, and the data center in the cloud. It's not the media type. So I'm totally okay with having tape as, as, as any form of even slightly degraded speed because I know that it's it's um, uh, uh, the service level I'm delivering from a cloud provider is still more than adequate. So when you look at things like Gmail, you look at things like uh, uh, Amazon Glacier, you know those kinds of large repositories. If you're going to do it at scale, I think tape is part of it. Now, one thing that um, I will say. You know, so Bob probably is a little biased. Um, he he has something of an affinity for for for, for tape, um, but. If I were to leave the the viewers from today's call with one piece of guidance, here's what I'd, I'd offer. And I guess if we're not doing sound bites yet, I should have saved this. But here's the thing: um, throw away your presumptions of of what you're doing before, whether it's disk versus tape, whether it's snapshots versus backup, um, uh, where the backup should live. You know, all of those kinds of older presumptions. And what you really need to figure out is what do you need to recover from. Right, and whether it's you think it's it's weather based like a tsunami or theft based or how fast you need to roll back an app, you need to think about what you need to recover from. Once you've got that, then you can start to do a cost based and a feature based assessment of the technologies plural. Almost nobody's gonna have a one size fits all uh, of disk plus tape plus cloud plus snaps plus backup. Um, but but throw out your presumptions first. Think about the goal and then decide the methods um, instead of what a lot of people still do from the other side around. 
Um, you know, one thing, Bob, that um, Jeffrey asked you earlier about um, uh, uh, power and cooling, but as I recall, some of the things that you guys have done in store over with, uh, with LTO6 actually do have to do with things like hibernation, which uh, further reduces uh, power savings, as well as uh, uh, you guys are doing variable transfer right now, right? Because uh, one of the big challenges that I, I used to have a problem with, um, uh, Calvin, one of the problems I do have with my LTO5 drive is, is that my single server and its backup solution actually won't sustain the throughput that an LTO5 drive is capable of, much less what an LTO6 drive is capable of. And so what happens is, you can actually hear my drive, it shoe shines. Um, it has to go back and forth because it's going pretty quick and then I run out of buffer. And so it actually has to slow down and rewind. Yes, everyone go like this. It makes the... So special effects. Very good. Okay. So you have to slow down the tape, back it back up, and then keep on writing from where it left over again. And so that whole shoe shining I we can we can fix you up with a new server as well. You yeah. know, I've tried that. Um, that. Uh, and uh, and nobody has sent me um any any small proliance. Um but uh, it's all but I, I do have I do have an LTO five drive. Anyway, um which at least makes it better than what Calvin's got. Um, but Bob, can you can you take us through? Because I thought that was actually the the large forty four petabyte thing. That's that's impressive. But I think a lot of things. I think a lot of folks out there, particularly in mid market, um, uh, that think, oh, I don't have that much tape. Maybe I can just get away with a bigger disk drive. Um, I think they need to reassess as as regulatory compliance goes lower and lower in the industry stack, and they have those same levels of five year, seven year retention requirements. They're not thinking through, am I going to have disk spinning for seven or ten years? Am I going to have a cloud provider that's going to hold that data for that long? They need retention requirements just like the big guys do, um, but I'm not sure they want to have a really loud older tape technology whirring and shoe shining in their environment. Take us through what's new in LTO6 from, from that perspective, because I thought those were kind of interesting from a mid-market perspective. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm sorry to hear your server so slow that you end up shoe shining, <laughs> particularly because with the HP uh, LTO drives, we do have a thing called dynamic r data rate matching, which will allow the um, tape drive to run at a third speed. So you know, if you're running at a third speed or lower, um, now's the time to get some some good memory and a decent server in that, that office of yours, apart from a, the, the tape drive. So the, the, the data rate matching You know, the, the is other way we can solve that. Oh. Well, the data rate matching is there because in, in the olden days, um, when we were all boys, tape drives did have this shoe shine effect. And uh, we, we know from our reliability data that very few drives today actually do shoe shine simply because of the data rate matching function, uh, which again in an HP drive it's a it's a linear characteristic. You know, it it doesn't go in steps. It it just slows the drive right down and and continues to push data. The other thing a lot of backup applications will do is they will stream um, different jobs off different disks. So you maybe sequence four jobs onto a tape at the same time in order to maintain the transfer rate and, and avoid the, uh, A, avoid the shoe shining, but also uh, mm -hmm. to make sure you get the throughput to meet the backup window requirements. You know, when, if you calculate backup window based on a, a maximum throughput for a tape drive, you really need to try to have the, the technology around it supporting that transfer rate not just the tape drive. So we've got that. We've also got, as you mentioned, a, the hibernate mode. Uh, if the drives, are, if the HP uh, LTO6 drives are not moving tape, they will close down. They will they will shut off all unessential or, un, or unnecessary functions until data is ready to be transferred again. And they they will just start up when they're ready when the data is uh, amassed in, in the buffer. So um, that's good stuff. We're also always working on trying to make sure the drives make less noise. More and more drives are going into office environments in a standalone uh, configuration. And we do not want to have noisy tape drives in offices. So we've looked at enclosures. We work on new enclosures. And we continue to try to do that. I'd, 
can't give you the, the decibel numbers off the top of my head, but I'm sure uh, someone in my team could get that to you. I want LTO 6 then, Bob. No LTO Fair 5 enough. for me. LTO 6. You know, I, I, got to, I, I think I've got a better solution. So since Calvin doesn't yet have any LTO, I think Calvin should get my LTO 5 drive. And then, and then you could just have to find one LTO 6 drive, Bob, says into me, and that way both of us get a better experience than what we've got going right now. I mean, just kind of, you know, just handing stuff down to your little brothers. You know, Calvin gets my, uh, gets my, uh, my hand-me-downs. I totally yeah. think that's going to work for us. Um, you, guys, you guys aren't going to get in a bar fight over this, are you? But I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, and and just just to be clear though, and, and I, I don't mean this to sound like a plug, but one thing that um, that Bob you corrected me on when um, when we were talking about this offline was um, I thought everything that we were talking about earlier was defined as part of the LTO six architecture, and that's actually not true. Some of the things we talked about today are actually part of HP's implementation of LTO six. It's not all just what's in LTO six itself. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, LTO six <laughs> as a is, is the format which is defined by the, the three uh, technical provider companies who are involved with LTO. And that lays down the way the data has to be put on the tapes to ensure that you've got um, the ability to read tapes from multiple vendors. So uh, if, if you have an IBM LTO 6 drive, you know you can put a, an LTO 6 tape written on that drive into anyone else's LTO6 drive and it will be read and it will be written to and you can send it back to the IBM drive and it will work. Um, similarly, you know, mm -hmm. the HP drives, so, so it's, everything it's more is than done for compliance. Sorry. It's more than just, you know, it's, like, it's, it's more than backwards compatibility, it's yep. cross compatibility. Yes, indeed. Yep. I yeah. like that. Which is, which is what has been the success of uh, LTO. You know, we, we've, sh we've shipped millions of drives because it's an open standard and people can trust it and they can transfer their data. Um, and especially in today's uh, media and entertainment world where LTO more and more is being used as a, a medium to put uh, TV and film programs onto both for transport and for manipulation of the data. Uh, a great example of that was... Uh, a program that James Cameron, the, the, the film producer, did with uh, LTO5 tape drives a while ago where he went down into the Mariana Trench uh, in his little submarine and recorded some amazing film. And I can't stop saying film, but actually there was no film involved in it at all. It was all recorded on LTO5 tape and then the post-production work was done from that. And the 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 data could be passed around between different machines and re-recorded on the different tapes and different tape drives with complete confidence that the compatibility was going to com continue. And Bob, I assume that was with LTFS? I believe so, yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, and another interesting I think we've got some... I just actually saw this in an email over the weekend is that Santa Clara Consulting Group who tracks uh, the uh, the tape industry specifically actually just released a report that said the, uh, the 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 tape business is actually up. So more more proof positive that uh, you know that the the tape is dead mantra is, should be dead because Santa Clara Consulting Group says that there's actually been more tape sold in the last quarter than in the previous year and over quarter over quarter. Yeah, they, they, that, that's the the tape capacity shift in in calendar quarter four. Um, I think it was over five petabytes in the quarter. Um, you might want to check that number, but it's, it, you know, it, it really does continue to increase as people are storing more and more uh, data for compliance, uh, for regulatory needs. You know, everybody is considering all of that email that I mentioned earlier. You know, if you have to search it, you need to have access to it and. Uh, you, you don't want to keep all of that on your expensive arrays. One question that we haven't, uh, we haven't brought up, and that is the uh, lifespan of the tape itself. 
Are we still seeing the same types of lifespans, um, uh, replacements of, of, of tape that we reuse uh, a lot, or uh, is, is that actually also been improved? I, I think the, um, the longevity of tape it has improved over the years. Um, I know every, lots and lots of people have really bad memories of tape based on uh, compact cassettes that you used in the car, and there was all that fluttery stuff on the side of the highway. Um, I, I honestly believe and know that you know those days are gone. Um, the, the, the tape handling in our drives, um, to be fair to the old compact cassettes, you know people would leave tape in their cars in a car park somewhere in the sunshine where it's like 100 degrees outside and everything would get hot and sticky and you get in the car, you put the air conditioning on, you take a hot tape, put it in your tape recorder and expect it to work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's really pushing it for any technology, let alone something like a compact tape. The tape we have today is uh, more robust. We put a lot of effort into the handling of the tape. We have uh, in, in the HP drive, again, this is HP technology rather than uh, general LTO TPC technology. We lift the tape off whenever it uh, comes to a standstill off the heads so that there's no opportunity for a, a, a tape passing a head, stopping and, and then sticking to the head uh, regardless of the humidity conditions or whatever. There is a lifter which lifts it off the head until it's ready to move again. When it's ready to move, it comes down and, and off it goes. Um, the the way the rollers are manufactured to, to ensure run out is really perfect for the the, um, the circumstances. A lot of a lot of invention, a lot of engineering has gone into ensuring the HP LTO6 drive is. Uh, as robust as it possibly can be. Sorry about the walk down memory lane there. Oh no, I was I was actually thinking about that same memory lane because I've been in in, uh, in Texas since 1980, where we get almost three months a year of triple digit heat, and uh, and back in 1980, um, the first media that I was actually storing data on was a uh, was a tape uh, a computer tape cassette um, from Tandy. Um, way back in the day. So yeah, and I can kind of recall a couple of those that might have melted when I first stuck them in a drive. So. And I used to DJ on tapes, and I remember when they got hot and sticky, they also started to stretch, so the music started to get really slow. And then, of course, you also had uh, layer bleed-through, so uh, all of a sudden you'd hear, you'd hear like echoes and stuff like that for, for tape like that. And of course, uh, in in data data uh, situations, I remember there were there was a, there was a a company I worked with where the one IT person, the one that was uh, tasked with doing the backup, would actually take all of his the backup tapes sure. home with him as the offsite storage option. And of course, we never knew if he was storing it in the basement or if he was storing it on you know throwing them on top of the roof. And, uh, and and waiting for times to actually go get the, the tapes to, to bring them back. So um, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very in, important factor yeah. in this whole thing. So we've got to wrap this up. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's start with uh, Jason. Jason, where can people find you, uh, ask questions or, or anything like that? So uh, best place is uh, Twitter, jbuff, J-B-U-F-F. Um, you can also uh, uh, hit my blog, uh, technicaloptimist.com. Um, and uh, if you want to go really, really old-fashioned, um, you can also email me. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, jason.buffington at esg-global.com. And you won't remember that, so just Bing search it instead. <laughs> All right. And, and Bob? Yeah, well, um, I'd just like to say that we had a lot of memory lane there about how bad tape was. I'd like to just remind everybody that the store, HP LTO6 Store Ever is a great product line. You know, we are taking uh, the, the, the technology and we're using it from single tapes at 6.25 terabytes up to multi-slot libraries with up to 44 petabytes, offering fantastic uh, cost 
a gigabyte performance uh, and a, a great opportunity for people to improve their overall backup environments along with our store once tape and disk configurations. So that's uh, a great thing. I'm available at the old-fashioned uh, hp.com. Um, I'm not a Twitter person yet. I'm just so old. Is is there is there a good white paper but, uh, up on HP that to people me. could read through? Um, there are lots of white papers, lots of information. If you go to hp.com and look for store ever, um, there, there's a, some great stuff. There's some fantastic chalk talks on YouTube that I know Calvin will uh, refer you to. He's got more information on that than I have. Um, a lot of videos. There's, uh, it's a really exciting technology and well worth a look. I have never heard anyone say tape was an exciting technology. I'm not going to disagree with you, but I've never heard anyone actually use those words with a straight face. Well, maybe about 30 years but ago. Jason, yeah. 30 you two guys were fighting over who got a drive. How exciting is that? Fair enough. <laughs> and Kelvin, uh, why don't you tell us uh, how people can get a hold of you? A uh, uh, lot of questions could, can filter through you, and, and, and you can talk to Bob and Jason freely on that, right? Yeah. What I would definitely encourage, if you have a question for Bob, ping me on Twitter, and once I get more than 10, I will force him to get a Twitter account so that he engages and I don't have to be the middleman for everything. So, uh, you know, there's my uh, Twitter right there, HP Storage Guy. Uh, that's easy way to get a hold of me. You can also get me on uh, the, our blog, which is at hp.com forward slash storage forward slash blog. All right. We learned a lot about LTO. We learned a lot about tape storage backup and how it's really not dead. Uh, you think of it as your long-term solution because you will, have, you will have a disk solution, you will have a cloud solution, and you must have a tape solution in a small business, in a large business, in an enterprise situation. And I think that's the most important thing we learned. Uh, tape is not dead. In fact, not only is it backwards compatible, it's also cross-compatible. And people will get into bar fights over tape storage methods. And uh, it, is, it does happen. So this is Jeffrey Powers, of course, Geekazine. Think Magazine. Put in a geek, you got Geekazine. That's my Twitter handle as well. I'd like to thank everybody for being part of this HP TechCast. We do this every single month. So if you guys like to, if you, uh, if you have some subjects that you want to talk about in the enterprise area, let me know, and, uh, and we will we'll get that on one of the next TechCasts. So thanks again for everybody for watching. For Calvin Zito, Jeffrey Powers. You guys have a great one, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Did you know that 77% of enterprises are still using tape? So if you thought tape was dead, think again. Got cold data? Did you know that tape is 15 times more economical than disk? HP has the broadest tape portfolio available in the industry and just announced Store Ever Storage with LTO 6. It's our sixth generation LTO technology. Our tape portfolio spans from SMB to enterprise. HP Store Ever with LTO 6 is one of the most cost effective, reliable, durable, energy efficient, and secure technologies available today. And the best part is, when paired with HP Store One Backup or HP Store All Archiving, you can lower your costs on long-term data protection and retention. Mm. For more information, visit hp.com forward slash go forward slash store ever. So, what are you waiting for? Check it out. <laughs>